Good afternoon from India. My name is Munish Gupta and I am the president of the Foreign Correspondents Club of South Asia, also known as FCC South Asia. Welcome to the UN Food Systems Summit Media Briefing for the Asia Pacific, hosted by FCC South Asia on our virtual platform today, the 30th of June. This event is being streamed live on FCC South Asia website and on our Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, social media handles. At the end of the briefing, you're welcome to please share your questions through FCC Facebook and YouTube uh, pages. They will be put up by the UN team to the moderator for the panelists. Uh, thank you for joining us. I particularly thank all my media friends who are here today. Uh, today's briefing is about an important global event convened by the United Nations. Mm -hmm. Moderating the panel uh, today will be Dr. Martin Frick. He is the deputy to the UN Secretary General Special Envoy for the Food System Summit 2021. He previously served as the senior director of UN Climate Change, where he was overseeing the implementation of the Paris Agreement and the Secretariat's climate action work. He has also previously served as director for climate change at the UN's Food and Agricultural Organization. Uh, over to you, Dr. Martin Frick. Monish, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here and we have a full program for um, today. Before we go into it, let me just briefly give you a little bit of a housekeeping. Um, after um, this, I will be asking our distinguished panelists just to do a short introduction um, on the topic from themselves. Journalists um, who are here are requested please to identify themselves in the questions and also the media outlet. They are with, and in the interest of time, I would ask both journalists and our panelists who are answering to keep the questions and the answers um, short and succinct. Um, let me give you maybe two, three minutes introduction of what this food system summit is. There were food summits on the level of heads of states and government before with the United Nations, but this is the first time that we speak about food as a system. And that's for a very good reason, because if you look at food from a justice and equity point, one of the absurdities we are living with is that more than 80% of the world's poorest who don't have access to enough food, who are starving, are actually food producers. So those who are sitting at the source are suffering most, and they're suffering also under the impact of climate change, where on the other side, our food systems is more than one third of the problem. If you add to the about 22% that um, agriculture emits, also the waste of food, which is enormous, um, and our habits, the packaging, the transport of food, then food is the one sector that is contributing most to climate change. It is also our food production, which is the biggest user of fresh water. It's the biggest driver of deforestation. It's the biggest killer of biodiversity. So on the one side, our food systems are not just and not equal. And if you consider that 3 billion people, almost half of the world population, cannot afford healthy and nutritious food, and you see the current COVID pandemic and what that actually means if people are weak and not healthy because they are not getting enough nutritious food, then you see the magnitude of the problem. On the other side, if you consider the Paris Agreement and our collective goal of keeping global warming well below 1.5 degrees, then you is obvious that our food systems have to be a part of that. Let me give you one data point. Yesterday, Canada, not known to be a hot country, had in one city 47 degrees centigrade, unprecedented heat wave, and that also points to the urgent action. Now, this food system summit is built on various components. We have five action tracks looking into the main topics from a global perspective. And I'm very happy that Professor Hook is here today, who is leading our action track on resilience. But we are also doing national level dialogues in by now 135 countries where everybody can participate on a local, regional and national level into this debate. And then we have a great circle of champions who are helping us spreading the word. 
And you have three of our wonderful champions with us today. Professor Naoko Ishii, Cherry Atalano, and Vijay Kumar, who will introduce themselves um, in a second. So let me conclude by saying the summit itself will be during the United Nations General Assembly end of September, um, convened by the Secretary General of the United Nations um, and followed by all the heads of state and government on this planet. And we are now four weeks um, before our pre-summit, which will be three intensive days of discussion with all walks of global society, with approximately 100 ministers coming to Rome to discuss food as a system and finding collective solutions. And with that, I would ask our panelists for their short introductory um, remarks, starting with Professor Salim Hook. Um, Salim Ul Hook is the chair of our Action Track 5, as I said, on resilience. And he's the, internet, the director of the International Center for Climate Change and Development, ICAD, in Bangladesh. Salim, over to you. Thank you very much, Martin, and uh, good afternoon from uh, Dhaka, Bangladesh. It's a privilege to be here with you. So as you've heard, I, am, uh, I have the privilege of uh, co-chairing action track number five of the UN Food System Summit, which is on the topic of resilience and how do we make food systems more resilient, uh, particularly given the, uh, the pandemic that we have seen that has affected uh, food in many different ways from production to consumption all over the world and shown that we do not have resilient food systems in many parts of the world. And we need to connect, correct that. <clears throat> the experience I've had so far as the uh, co-chair of Action Track 5 has been extremely uh, interesting because our mandate as chairs of the Action Tracks was to speak to everybody. We spoke to farmers groups, fishers groups, indigenous groups all over the world, private sector, public sector, governments. We got more than 2,000 inputs on ideas to take things forward uh, at the Food System Summit, which, as you know, is not to agree something at the summit, but to agree a path forward for the next nine years left of this decade to take actions. So it's an action summit that we will hopefully take forward. And we, we were very, very uh, honored by the level of uh, participation that we got from all over the world and all different stakeholders. And we have now packaged them into a group of uh, what we call solution clusters and action areas. Three summit taking place in Rome at the end of July, after which member states will then have uh, the task of finding the ones that are most uh, resonant and member states would then make the final decision on which ones go forward to the summit and then go after the summit. And as I said, the key element here is to think about implementing actions after the summit to make our food systems more resilient going forward. I'll stop there for now. Look forward to your questions. Thank you very much, Professor Hook. And our next panelist is Professor Naoko Ishii from the University of Tokyo, where she is leading the Center for Global Commons. Before that, she was the head of the Global Environmental Facility, where she decided over billions of dollars to be invested in, um, I may say, in a very intelligent way to work on our common um, future. Um, she is our vice chair and expert on finance in our Food Systems Champions Network. And I failed to say that Professor Hook is not only our Action Track Chair for Action Track 5, but also one of our wonderful champions. But with that, I would hand over to um, Professor Naoko Ishii for your short introduction. Thank you, Martin, uh, for the very kind introduction. And, and uh, thank you, everybody. I'm very happy to be here. Uh, maybe you can bring my slides uh, to, to the screen. Uh, because I have one thing which I really want you to, um, to, to take away from this short session. The food system has been extremely useful to expose every one of us to the challenge uh, we are facing, uh, which is caused by the food system. Martin already said 
uh, or maybe that uh, Dr. Fook already said that it's really, really important to take the food as a system, a kind of a united system, which revealed a lot of things that uh, which we haven't really realized uh, before that. So this uh, page, uh, this slide shows that the fat kind of hidden cost the food system has caused. There are three important hidden costs uh, from the uh, from the food system. One is actually the environmental cost, which is about seven a trillion. Uh, that it's a, it's a hidden cost because of the deforestation or land degradation uh, or the um, uh, of the carbon footprint. Uh, then there is another cost, which is a uh, human health, uh, which is uh, the, 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 because of that the, uh, uh, the bad uh, the lack of nutrition and the, um, uh, the, the not proper diet. So there is a huge hidden cost of the human health. Then the last cost is about social cost, the social economic cost, uh, because a lot of community has been suffering that and uh, not having the right and the food system. So there are three important uh, hidden costs coming from this food system, and this totaled actually the twelve trillion dollar uh, per, per year. And while it compared is compared with the market value of the food system, which is ten trillion US dollars. Actually, food as a system has caused actually hidden cost of two trillion that then are beyond the market value. So food as a system not really adding value to us, it's actually that then extracted and add the value from us. So that's a very important point and which I really wanna um, bring to, to everyone. That the reason why we have this hidden cost is because the current market system doesn't measure those uh, natural the capital of natural capital, a social capital, and human capital. It only captures that the kind maybe financial capital or physical capital. And, uh, and in order to really address this issue of hidden cost of the food system, we have to find a way to how to measure those and uh, value. Um, that brought by natural capital, human capital, and social capital. And because I am a vice chair of the finance uh, among Champions Network, one important uh, 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 challenge going forward is how we can create the financial system which captures uh, those costs, uh, the value of those three capitals, uh, natural and human and social. So that is uh, that, that challenge. The good news is that that we have already started some kind of an, uh, uh, um, the good start like an TNFD in, FD in addition to TCFD, if it's captured the carbon, we are now trying to capture the nature uh, in the in the market system and also science based target for nature. So there are several um, the trial to reveal and measure and value of those and the capital um, in, in the current system. So there is a going, to, but it's going to be a very big task going forward. But with that, um, uh, maybe we can bring another uh, slide uh, to us. It may take a little bit of time, <laughs> but then uh, if we are able to, thank you, if we were able to transform the current food system to a much more regenerative nature positive system, it also bring a lot of investment and the business opportunities. Uh, uh, it says on a five, six trillion per year, so that with some kind of investment, it also bring uh, the business and the investment opportunity uh, to us. On top of that, maybe the last slide, that uh, there are uh, that few actions to be, um, uh, maybe a uh, few transition we can bring. Um, but the top of the, uh, the action plan is that the, how we can bring the right information uh, to the consumer and the investors, which will bring those, um, uh, uh, will, will have an impact of the entire value chain through demand side to the system. So that is actually the one uh, way of um, addressing uh, this challenge uh, as a food system. Let me stop here. And then I will, I will be very happy to come back to that discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. And thank you, everybody. Noko, thank you so much. And these are staggering numbers that a global system produces 10 trillion value 
but 12 trillion in hidden costs and environmental costs, but also too often in health costs, in people suffering. Food should be medicine, but food as we have it obviously makes us ill. Our next panelist is Cherry Attilano. She is also a food system champion and a an UN nutrition ambassador. Jerry is from the Philippines where she runs Agria and your job title is a proud one. It says founding farmer and president. Jerry, over to you to explain what Agria is and your take on the UN Food System Summit. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Martin Frick for organizing this and for moderating. Um, so for Agrea, we've been working with 30,000 smallholder farmers in the Philippines. And of course, I'm a UN food systems champion, uh, acting in the leadership team of Action Track One, ensuring safe and nutritious food for everyone. Uh, in the Philippine context, I'm also the advisor of our convenor uh, to design our UN food systems in a country level, not only in the dialogue, but also beyond the dialogue. So where am I in the situations of the food systems? I think I'm representing the youth, the women, the smallholder farmers, and at the same time, the small medium enterprises. Uh, what we've been doing so far since you know the launch of the food systems, uh, especially in the champions, I've been witnessing a lot of youth uh, who are actually you know, it, doing independent dialogues in the gateway, it seems that in, even in our social media, it seems that the youth are such backbone in communicating what we do in the UN food systems. Another one, um, in all the course of the dialogues that I've been involved for several months now, I've seen the fact that smallholder farmers are becoming indispensable in this process. More so the family farmers, those in the family farms, not only in Asia, but also in Africa, across actually the world, that they're becoming more valuable to bring nutritious food on every table, especially that our producers are also major consumers of our food, but somehow they're left behind. But I'm so happy that because of this UN Food Systems Champion, they're giving us it, and I know a third of our group in the champions and also in even in the leadership of different action tracks are actually smallholder farmers, civil society organizations, and youth groups. And lastly, I want to discuss about the involvement of women. Several consultations have been happening, not only here in the local level, for example, in Southeast Asia, but also in the global context, you know, the importance of women, they're now not becoming not just a segment of priority, but this food system summit is really putting women as the center and a critical mass for solutions making. So I'm ready to, to attend to some questions later on, uh, Dr. Frick, thank you. Jerry, thank you so much. And it's so important to get also the producer's viewpoint into our summit. Vijay Kumar, our next um, panelist, is representing the producers in the Champions Network, and he is running the Farmers Empowerment Corporation um, in India. Vijay, the floor is you to present um, Ritu Sadikara Samsta to us and also your role in the UN Food System Summit. Over to you, Vijay. Uh, thank you, Martin. And uh, it was great hearing the panelists because uh, you have made my task easy. Uh, can, uh, can my presentation be loaded, please? Uh, as uh, Martin mentioned, I'm uh, heading the Raitu Sadhikara Samasta, which is a farmer's empowerment corporation. And we are engaged in a very large agroecology program for precisely the purposes that uh, uh, Dr. Salim Haq said for resilience. Naoko mentioned about externalities. And then uh, we had Cherry mentioned about the role of small and marginal farmers and uh, women. So I believe very strongly that uh, solution is with the farmers. Uh, I come from Andhra Pradesh, a state with 54 million uh, population. Uh, our vision is by 2031 that all, all 8 million farmers and farm workers should transform to agroecology. Next, please. In about, uh, we started the program. Uh, uh, yeah. Agroecology is basically farming in harmony with nature for farmers' welfare, food and nutrition security, 
and climate change resilience. Next, please. Next slide. Yeah. We started the program five years ago. And in five years, the number of farmers enrolled has increased from 40,000 to 750,000 farmers and farm workers in 2020-21. The government is uh, funding this uh, program and about $250 million have been committed to this. And uh, we have a philanthropy supporting it to a tune of 16 million US dollars. Next. The results for these farmers have been uh, very positive, both in terms of uh, decrease in the cost of cultivation. The yield differences are marginal. In fact, uh, natural farming gives higher yields. And 86% farmers in Andhra Pradesh are small and marginal farmers. So it's a question of food security for uh, farmers and farm workers as much as for the consumers. So extra production actually increases food security for themselves. And there's a significant increase in net income for the farmers. In addition, they have reported better health, better biodiversity, and uh, better resilience to floods and uh, prolonged dry spells. Next, please. Next slide. Yeah. Uh, in our program, the women uh, self-help groups, they play a very important role. Uh, we have more than 100,000 women self-help groups who play a very active role in planning for the program, learning, working together, financing the program. So this is our basic strength, the agency of women, and that has enabled this transformation to happen in such a small uh, uh, pace of time. Next, please. Next. Yeah. So we have other, uh, you know, vital uh, element in our program is the role of farmer heroes. You can see the champion farmer, uh, woman uh, hero, she trains other farmers. So we believe in farmer to farmer knowledge dissemination. We believe that farmers are best trainers, farmers are the best scientists, and therefore uh, they have a very major role to play in, in this program. Next one, please. So agroecology does take time. Uh, so there is a farmer's journey. It takes about three to five years for a farmer to completely transform to natural farming. And uh, for a whole village, it can take five to eight years. So therefore, what is critical is how do you uh, provide handholding support for such a long time? And uh, uh, just to conclude, the participation in the UN Food System Summit and sharing our experiences and listening to Farmers' organizations from uh, other countries has been very, very beneficial. Uh, I've learned a lot. Uh, we have hosted independent dialogues. Uh, and every uh, of the producers, and the consensus was that farming in harmony with nature is uh, the best connected answer to all the problems. And also, uh, health and nutrition depends on how well the soil is managed and how how well the food is produced. Uh, thank you very much. I'll conclude here. Thank you. <coughs> Apologies. Um, thank you very much indeed, um, Vijay, um, for your remarks. Um, you mentioned that farmer to farmer is the best way to communicate. And that points to really an issue um, which is not an easy one. If you do, as we say we do, a people summit, an action summit. How do you go to the individual um, organization, to the farmers, to the producers on the ground? And that's one question <clears throat> I would like to ask to Professor Hook as an action track chair. How do you do that? How do you get the voices from the ground in this process? What's your experience <clears throat> with this very tall ask as we are relevant to almost 8 billion people on this planet? Salim, over to you. Thank you very much, Martin. Uh, it, that's, that is the big challenge uh, for all of us in this uh, food system summit uh, architecture that we've just described. <clears throat> so I think I would say three things. Firstly, from the action track side, we have been talking to many, many different groups and people, stakeholders, and you just heard from a few of them. And we've been collating ideas and inputs from them. And as I mentioned earlier, more than 2,000 ideas have come to us, which we have 
put into various buckets and try to put them under various headings so that we could form coalitions to take them forward. So the idea is that we'll have coalitions of actors, <coughs> including national governments, local governments, private sector, farmers in particular, who would align themselves with certain of these solution clusters and take them forward at the pre-summit and then to the summit and most importantly, beyond the summit. At the same time, we also have <coughs> a whole series of national dialogues that you mentioned in your opening remarks where countries are carrying out these discussions at a national level across different stakeholders within government and outside government. And so we hope that the, the global discussions will synchronize with national ones <coughs> at the national level and come together in, in this uh, call for action and activities with coalitions of actors that will continue beyond the summit itself. Apologies for my sort. Thank you. Thank you very much, Salim. I would suggest I'm not calling upon you. And if you raise your hand, we are happy to give you the floor. And thank you for being with us despite your sore throat. Um, I would have a question um, to Jerry Atalano. Um, young people are crucial in developing solutions for the future. Now, food systems is something that experts have been talking about for many years. How do young people respond to this system? Do they engage? Do they understand the systemic nature of the challenge? Jerry, over to you. Well, that's a very interesting uh, question, Dr. Martin, right? I think in the UN Food System Summit, we become uh, intentional from the beginning to really include the youth. We have youth champions uh, in the network, actually, that they've been very, very active in intensifying and magnifying our voice on where the summit would go, but more importantly, really taking actions, not only on the dialogues, but different interventions in their local level. Like for example, case and point here in the Philippines, uh, in, in August, you know, we even have a youth dialogue just for this. And we also launched the National Youth uh, for Agriculture Summit in support to the, to the UN Food Systems uh, Summit. Uh, so what I'm saying right now is I think the youth are, are tired of just staying at home. Uh, they really want to be part of this. They really want to belong. It's because the future is for them. You know, they are the now, the current and the present. But more than that, the future is for them. And another, I guess, is because I always say this, that our farmers are endangered species. Globally, our farmers are 60 years old in average age, and our population is insatiably growing. So with the youth intervention, not only on the ground, but really on creating different dialogues. Uh, actually, with this you know, virtual world that we're having now, if you check the UNFSS gateway, so many dialogues there are led by our youth from every corner of the world. And it's really happening. You know, there's, there's progress happening, there's work happening. And more so, aside from just talking and doing all of this in the dialogue, they're also taking actions in different organizations they belong. And another one, uh, what's beautiful right now, my observation is even different academia are really intensifying how their youth can be involved in, in the support of the UN Food System Summit. But for, more so, a lot of groundwork in the grassroots right now are really on encouraging the children of farmers not to leave the farm, but stay in the farm, not just become a farmer, but really see opportunity to become game changers in terms of being an agri-entrepreneurs or social entrepreneurs or even advocates in the agriculture sector. Another one is the intensification of, of digital world where a lot of youth are involved also in the on-farm and off-farm value chain. So for example, the online marketplace where it's actually shortening the gap of the producers and the consumers. Most of the people in these online marketplaces are run by 
are, are the youth, you know, uh, running this because they're more geeky, they're into tech. And another one, even in the agri-tech area, a lot of youth are actually being involved in this sector. And this summit somehow just supported them to really uh, be in great participation. But lastly, Martin, I guess, is even the youth are very active. They're still looking for mentorship. They're still looking for financial support to really, you know, put the innovations on the ground. And I think uh, they're really strong in developing different advocacies, not only on the agriculture, but more importantly, in the nutrition part of the summit. Thank you, Jerry. And it reminds me, the deputy head of the World Food Program recently said 20 years ago, we said that the sons and daughters of farmers should become architects and doctors and lawyers. Today, we should say that the doctors of architects, lawyers and, um, and, and, and doctors should go into farming. And that reminded me um, really that. Let's stay on a grassroots level before I go back to um, Professor Naoko Ishii and go to Vijay Kumar. And you mentioned agroecology as the basis of your work. Um, what role do you see has that played so far and is there a connection here between the very local and our global discussions vijay over to you yeah uh, thanks martin uh, in all the dialogues i have had three independent dialogues and also the national dialogue uh, the participants were uh, of unanimously of the view that agroecology is the future of agriculture uh, because it meets the objectives of farmers' welfare, more incomes in the hands of farmers, less risk in the context of climate change, and uh, in our case, especially reduces dependence on uh, monsoons. So, and especially in the context of uh, COVID pandemic, people are very much quality of food. So, agroecology, which is uh, you know free from synthetic chemicals. <laughs> People uh, strongly uh, believe that the quality of food and nutrition is better. So with all these uh, positive factors, uh, Martin, uh, there was very, uh, you know, I would say unanimous endorsement in all the dialogues that I've held uh, in India with Africa and, uh, uh, yeah, these two countries uh, and with in the indigenous people with in uh, Jharkhand, our tribal communities. So there was a consensus everywhere that uh, we have to uh, farm in harmony with nature and not against nature. That was a unanimous view. Thank you. Thank you very much, Vijay. And you spoke also about flooding. There was a question from Bishma Katel um, coming in, asking exactly that about farming possibilities and food security also during times of flooding. Do you want to add to this point, please? Uh, this is a very important uh, uh, issue for us, uh, Martin. We have close to 1,000 kilometers of coastline, and we have uh, constant flooding. And we could see very clearly last year, where we had heavy rains uh, you know, at a very critical period for rice, and uh, the paddy fields were uh, underwater for two weeks. But when the water drained away, the fields which are cultivated with natural farming were resilient. There was very little damage, but just adjacent fields uh, were completely damaged. So in the context of resilience, uh, definitely uh, this uh, stands out as, a, as perhaps the best intervention for the farmers. Thank you, Vijay. And let me just remind the audience, you can ask your questions using Facebook or Twitter or on YouTube, we are listening on all channels to really respond to your questions. Now, I want to go to Professor Naoko Ishii. We've been on the grassroots level for now, but big companies and industry is certainly a massive player when it comes to global food systems. Um, what role has the private sector and what influence does the private sector have in this um, summit preparation process? Naoko. Thank you. I actually am very happy to see the private sector together with consumer and producer actually woke up together and try to find a way, um, uh, their role to how to uh, transform 
the food system, I mentioned the three hidden costs, the health costs, um, human health costs, the planetary health costs, and the social costs. And the private sector can play a key role to address and uh, all those three uh, hidden costs by transforming their way of engaging the food system. So one thing which I was very happy to see is now the private sector, let's say in Japan, also woke up to realize that the, uh, when they import food, what to, to put the food on the supermarket, they come to know more about what kind of footprint uh, this and uh, um, the, the piece of the food uh, is and also what kind of a uh, the social cost, the labor cost, uh, the, the child labor cost it may have. So that the food system conversation, food system preparation for the food system reveal them to, to those kind of hidden costs and uh, without a food system we would not have been even uh, uh, come to know. So, so that then they are now together to find out what would be the best way to address those um, uh, the hidden costs uh, by either demanding more information through the supply chain and demanding more to actually the producer and the tracers and the uh, uh, traders along the value chain and also educate the consumers to, to ask that the uh, more information so that together we can transform the food system from smallholder farmers uh, to the, uh, the tracers and then uh, the, uh, the, the producers and the traders and the consumers and together that then we can we can really transform the food system thank you thank you very much naoko and um we have been engaging with the private sector in the summit um we are the organizations so just to clarify there are no individual companies in the preparation process but it's associations of industry assets associations of producers or civil society in an equal process. Now, here's a question from Elizabeth Puranam from Al Jazeera, um, who is asking about our food habits. And Naoko, you just spoke to the consumers and the need to educate them. Um, and the water footprint of our food choices and related to that, how much will cutting down of meat consumption be on the agenda on the Food System Summit next month? I can speak to that, but I'm also looking at our panelists, whether anyone wants to come in on this question. Well, maybe then I could start speaking about it because meat consumption is a very complicated issue which needs to be debated in nuance. Um, if you look at some places of the world, like um, Sub-Saharan Africa, we actually have not enough animal protein. We have stunted and wasted children because children in the first 1,000 days of their lives do not have access to animal protein, to milk, to eggs, to meat, and they would desperately need it. At the same time, we have a situation in which industrialized produced meat is way overproduced in rich countries and way overconsumed in rich countries, which is an environmental problem as much as it is a health problem because overconsumption of red meat has been singled out by the World Health Organization as a health risk. So we are trying to address the whole range and we will look particularly into the production methods. Um, it's a matter of quality, it's a matter of how you raise livestock. A small farmer having cattle outside in a um, system in which also trees and cropping are intertwined is not the problem. The problem is thousands of animals on a small space in one stable because there you need antibiotics <clears throat> to keep the animals healthy and the abuse of antibiotics goes all the way down the value chain into human consumption which makes our bodies resilient against antibiotics. In other words, if we are getting ill and we would need antibiotics, they don't work anymore. But there is also the environmental footprint of overconsumption of meat. So we need to have a balanced approach. We have to look at how it's being produced. We have to look at livelihoods um, because we cannot tell farmers to get out of livestock if that's part of their production. We also have to look into traditions. 
you cannot tell the Maasai from Eastern Africa to live without livestock because all of the local culture is on, on that. And the way they are raising and um, breeding their livestock doesn't have a negative environmental footprint. So it very much depends on where you are in the world, um, how much you are consuming, and really what food choices you are. And if you opt for quality and maybe a bit higher prices at times, it is helping yourself, your health, and it's also helping the environment. Um, let me look at my panelists, whether anyone wants to add. Vijay, please. Uh, just a, a brief point. In, in our country, agriculture, you know, crop, trees, and livestock go together. So it is, uh, you know, very much uh, integral part of uh, the uh, small farmers' agriculture. So I agree with you. Thank you very much. Um, we have spoken before about the COVID pandemic, and it has been a wake-up call on many levels, not least on food systems. The Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations will come out soon with this year's number on how many people on the planet are hungry and um, from everything I have heard so far it's going to be worrying. Um, so a lot of money is also spent post-COVID to build back better, better as the slogan goes and I would have a question to Terry Atalano. Um, can we use this money, can we use this political drive to build back better to also transform our food systems? Can they actually prevent pandemics? Can they help um, driving a more healthy future? Cherry. What an interesting uh, question, Martin. It's because, you know, uh, we've been working with the grassroots since the pandemic, right? My, my company, my social enterprise, Agria, we've been helping to transform the goods of the farmers from their farm because the lockdown happened during the the, the height of the harvest season, which is summer in the Philippines. And you know, in all the cross of this uh, time, I, I see a lot of problems on the ground, but also a lot of financial uh, support, especially coming from the private sector. There are some private sectors that are actually transitioning their uh, corporate social responsibility on how to help and maintain their, their employee pool to be healthier by sourcing locally from the communities of farmers. But another challenge, I guess, is you know, uh, in, in the Philippines, for example, uh, election is coming next year and our country is really suffering. We have 7.2 million uh, Filipinos now who are experiencing involuntary hunger and 12 million Filipinos are actually uh, losing their jobs. So this is a tremendous problem. I think there's such funds um, coming uh, from the government, but it's just really difficult to disburse this fund because of certain uh, bureaucratic protocols set in place, right? But hopefully this kind of, of restrictions later on, especially during the crisis, can actually be given enough solution. But another uh, wonderful things also that are happening, the civil society organizations are really leveling up their game, especially during the pandemic, on how to help smallholder farmers, you know, uh, bring their produce in the market and also how to make the, the people who are actually stuck in the metropolitan to be healthier, uh, be safer and still avail uh, affordable, nutritious food for everyone. So we know that food is political, but hopefully uh, because of this summit, we can go above and beyond all the politics. We, I think I still believe in the power of human spirit, you know, humanity is still above else with compassion and empathy, uh, we can bounce back better uh, beyond a political, you know, scenario that's happening left and right around us right now. Thank you very much, Cherry. And you raised a really important point. This is an action and a solution and a people summit. It's not a negotiation summit. We are implementing the sustainable development goals. Um, but I see there was a follow-up question from Elizabeth from Al Jazeera asking, how much are industrialized rich countries really prepared to talk about meat consumption as an environmental problem? Well, we are not going to negotiate that, but I have been following many of the country-level dialogues in OECD countries 
not least in my home country, Germany. And I have seen these questions coming up. People are debating meat consumption. And they come from very different angles. They come because they are concerned about climate change. They are concerned about animal, um, animal welfare. They are concerned about health. So I see that public opinion is really changing also in rich countries, understanding that there is a global problem that we all have to live up to, to bring the solution. Now, I'm very happy to hand the microphone, the virtual microphone, to Munish Gupta, our host, who also wants to ask a question. Munish, please. Well, thank you, Martin. It's been a wonderful dialogue and great to listen to all of you. I have some very general questions to be put to you, and I'm sure that the people listening, and there's a lot of people listening beyond journalists here. So, you know, we've been hit by the pandemic for now 15 months. What are the challenges, compulsions, and change of action thoughts that have happened in the last 15 months leading up to the summit? Uh, that would be my first question. And, um, and one of the aims of the summit was to deliver progress, tangible progress on the 17 SDGs. Uh, through a food system approach. So how much of that is going to be actually achieved? Uh, or will there be a setback because of the pandemic? Well, thank, thank, you. You. thank you very much, Munish. Two questions. So the challenges of COVID in the preparation of the summit, and I think there are two points to it. It is how do you organize a summit in terms of a pandemic? And to this day, I haven't even met everybody from my own team in person. So that was more than interesting, um, <clears throat> but also um, an incredible opportunity because normally you would plan for a meeting three months in advance and people would fly in. Today, we can decide to have a meeting tomorrow and we find a time zone that works for Professor Hoop, but also for um, Lawrence Haddad, who is in London. We meet somehow in the afternoon European time, and it works. That's also a great opportunity. Um, but in terms of challenges for food systems, we have seen empty supermarket shelves in the rich world, but much, much more dramatically. We have seen a staggering race in hunger and malnutrition um, all over the planet in poor countries. Let me give you an example. Um, X many children worldwide depend on school feeding to actually have one decent nutritious meal a day. Now, when the schools are being closed, um, many of these children didn't have a chance at all to get um, a meal a day. So one of the things that we are doing um, is promoting a coalition um, for school feeding um, where a whole range of actors join forces to ensure that more children can have a daily meal, at least when they are going um, to school. And on your second question about the concrete actions, this is all in the framework of the Sustainable Development Goals. And the frame the world community has set itself is until 2030 to achieve this really, really ambitious goals. And I mentioned that by now 135 countries are organizing um, national level dialogues. And the aim of these dialogues is to find, to define national pathways, how an individual country wants to transform. So this is an ongoing process, but the level of mobilization and political energy also resulting sometimes in weeks of dispute in a government who will be the national convener because it's attractive, it's a political um, role is really encouraging that this issue of um, we need to urgently transform our food systems has come to public opinion. So we are driving it from the top down with coalitions in which donor countries, um, NGOs, academia, companies can join forces. We have, for example, a coalition in the making where major companies are pledging to eradicate poverty in their value chains, which I think is massively good news. Um, but also on the other side, working from the bottom up, from the grassroots on the transformation is what hopefully will make this summit a success. But I would happily give the floor to the other panelists, which I can't see at the moment, whether anyone wants to add on these two very, very salient questions that Munish has asked. 
Sorry. Can I yes, thank you very much, Martin. Can I jump in? So, uh, Munish, this is a question very dear to my heart because uh, my work for the last uh, more than two decades has been in the climate change realm, working with the most vulnerable communities in the most vulnerable countries in Asia and Africa. And as it happens, the uh, impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic, both the virus itself, as well as the lockdowns and economic pressures, also hit the same vulnerable populations. And so going forward, the solution to making food systems more resilient is actually the same solutions that will make the whole world more resilient to the impacts of climate change and also biodiversity loss going forward. <clears throat> so to me, the big revelation and the big way forward is a recognition that the most vulnerable people on the planet need to be given a much greater say in what happens and much greater support in dealing with the impacts of climate change, very often which they have not caused. Thank you. Thank you very much. And um, Professor Salim Hook is, of course, one of the leading figures in the United Nations climate change negotiations. And that is a main point of this summit, that all of our deliberations are connected to the other global discussions on climate, on biodiversity, on stopping desertification. And one of these big global conferences that is coming up is called Nutrition for Growth, which will be in December in Tokyo, a massive event on um, nutrition. And I would like to ask Professor Naoko Ishii how this relates our food system summit and the nutrition for growth summit that is coming up in Tokyo very soon. Now, no, thank you so much. Actually, I just want to build on that the fact that Professor Fuchs said, and I very much agree with him on this analysis of why we have this program of the food system program as well as the COVID-19, because as he said, we th these programs share the same root cause, that is, that our economic, current economic system is in collision course with the planetary uh, uh, system, the stable and the resilient planet system, because we have been hitting their capacity and we did have the issue of the climate change, the biodiversity loss, and actually the COVID-19, because the, the, our economic system has been disturbing the integrity of the ecosystem by the food expansion, the settlement, and the infrastructure. So as he said, that, that the solution uh, to this uh, program is to really transform the way uh, the current economic system and how we can find a way to modify our system so that we can live within the planetary boundaries and to, um, to, to prosper. So the one way out is also how we can recognize that and we share this global commons and then how to save ourselves by safeguarding global com commons, which is extremely challenging, but then the Food System Summit, as well as at the climate change and other issues, um, then the Nutrition Summit, really uh, bring this awareness that we human share that the global commons and we have the shared responsibility to, to work on it. And from um, the top leadership to the, uh, the, the uh, multi-stakeholders, to the really that the, the, the most vulnerable people, and these are the huge opportunity uh, to to bring those issues to everybody, and we can be part of that and, uh, uh, solution. Um, be, being a consumer, being the producer, and uh, being the citizens. And uh, so the nutrition summit in Tokyo has already started to see this value because then now it's not just a food system summit, that it provoked uh, so many good questions, and we have another venue the occasion to address that issue as a part of the biggest, the bigger problem. Back to you, Martin. Uh, back to you. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed. I understand, um, Munish, you have one question that was communicated to you. Maybe we can ask that question now, and then I would ask all the panelists to very briefly give us your idea for what success would look like of this food system summit. All of you have been invested many hours, many days of your lives as volunteers. And I want to say that loud and clear for this summit. So what's your hope and expectation for it? But before we have Munish asking one more question. 
you know, I was sent a question by the United News of India, UNI, which is a wire service. And they said, look, there's enough food in the world to go around. And people need not die hungry or go hungry. What is the Food Systems Summit going to do to address this issue of how do you ensure equitable distribution of food that already exists? There's another issue of production, et cetera, et cetera, preservation. But there's enough food to go around. Are we going to address that issue? Absolutely. Um, Salim, you want to yeah. answer? Please. Well, I, I, I'm happy to have you answer as well. But I, you know, again, this is very dear to my heart. <laughs> and in, in Action Track 5 on resilience, one of the solution clusters that we are the champions for and are taking forward is to look at food as a human right, not just as a commodity. You're quite right. Everybody on the planet needs to be able to get access to decent food, a safe food, nutritious food, as a matter of right. And there's more than enough food to deliver that. We're just not geared to doing that. So yes, in my view, to answer the question on what would success look like, is if we can make that a human right, food as a human right, out of the summit. That would be a great success. Thank you. Thank you very much, Salim. Now, you did both in, all, in one, answering the question <laughs> and your closing remarks. I just have to add that an entire work stream looks into livelihoods because people need decent incomes. And when you have enough income, you have also access to food. Because the question is uh -huh. what there is enough food on the planet. It's a question of distribution and fairness and supporting um, the poorest and sharing the revenues in a much better and fairer way. Now, closing remarks. Vijay, let's start with you. Very close, short. What is your expectation to the summit? Uh, the, one of the comments by panelists was that 80% uh, of the producers themselves are hungry. So I would expect that the changes that we bring in the food uh, production system, move into nature-based uh, production system or agroecology will ensure that uh, farmers, 86% of whom are small and marginal farmers, uh, produce and consume nutritious food and they also supply nutritious food to others and are uh, resilient to climate change. And finally, I think there's a great urgency to all these actions because climate change is accelerating. And so the pace of actions cannot lag behind the pace of climate change. Thank you. Thank you very much. And it really is a call to transform those who are most in need to an army of practitioners and activists who can really help to counter this global crisis. And that's a beautiful vision. Thank you for that. Cherry your expectation of the Food Systems Summit, what would you hope for? My, what I hope for for the future of Food Systems Summit is it needs to be a country food systems transformation, like more than you know, 100 countries actually signed up for a dialogue. But I really want to, to see that it's Im implemented in the country level beyond the, the, the summit, right? Because that's our goal. And second one, more and more young people are actually to be involved, not only on dialogues, but really on implementation. And hopefully, uh, women are really giving enough you know, uh, equity in this uh, entire transformation. And lastly, I guess, Martin, I totally agree that uh, food should be a human right, right? And also, we need to emphasize the sacredness and sanctity of food, that it also um, uh, go cut across humanity, that we don't leave uh, no one behind after this summit. Thank you. Thank you very much, Cherry. I would interrupt for a second because there is one last second question coming in um, and that question is farmers are protesting in india how do you see this kind of protest is food surplus a problem anyone wants to answer this question bj uh, i think the the farmers distress is acute there's no doubt about it mm. and uh, so the fact that agriculture uh, is not profitable. So how do you make, it's again part of the bigger question uh, because the farmer's distress is also because of the external inputs that go into uh, cultivation. So uh, I think we need to 
transform the food production system so that farmers costs come down farmers resilience increases and therefore there is a greater uh, uh, cash income greater income for the farmers thank you vijay thank you so much we are at time i would like to give a couple of seconds to naoko for your closing remarks and um, hand over to monish to close us off naoko okay uh, my expectation on the food system is that we all wake up and to realize that we have a global shared responsibility to safeguard global commons which does include the food system and as a uh, the, uh, the, thing, uh, the, uh, the consumer the investor and as a global citizens that is it we are all in together Naoko, thank you so much and with my many thanks to the panelists and to our great host munish gupta i hand over to you munish to close this session Well, thank you, thank you, Martin, and thank you, all the panelists. Uh, I just have, uh, I have enjoyed the discussion. It's good to know what are the objectives and how do you all see uh, what can be done and and how it can be achieved at the Food uh, System Summit. I think it's a very important summit leading up to the 2030 agenda. I want to conclude by saying that COVID-19 to us in the media as well as anyone in the world has taught us a few things, and I would highlight Dr. Tedros's remarks the other day. Uh, Uh, when i was i think in the, in the context of uh, africa africa summit uh, africa day and he said that look we must realize that we should give up now all conflicts and confrontations and this should start the era of cooperation and collaboration and i would uh, heartily welcome and 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 and, and repeat what uh, naoko just said that we must work towards shared prosperity So thank you very much. I look forward to uh, to having you guys again uh, after your pre summit or maybe before the summit itself. And uh, what a lovely discussion! And keep up the good work. Thank you. And we'll close this broadcast now. Thank you. Thank you.